Our next case, our next case is Kasten Denovsky versus Harrington. Something like that. <laughs> Close enough. This is a 15 minute mini oral argument on the application. Welcome council. You may reserve some of your time if we do not use it up and we ask that you do your best to keep track of your own time. Um, you have two minutes of a free fire zone if you wish. Mr. Granzato, you know the drill. Good morning. Good morning. Mark Granzato on behalf of the plaintiffs and appellants. I mean, if there is a self-imposed limitation on questions, I waive it. Uh, I, I would like to try to reserve two minutes for the rebuttal. Um, uh, the, the issue, to become an important issue, involved in this case concerns um, whether uh, a, a notice of intent uh, must be filed when you amend a complaint against uh, an existing defendant to, to raise an additional theory in the case. The first question that the court has asked in the uh, order that brings us together today uh, was whether 2169B, I guess, yeah, 2912B, excuse me, does in fact apply to the amendment that was uh, proposed by the plaintiff in this case. Um, I, I was thinking on my drive here, uh, I sort of like to come before this court with sophisticated um, arguments with respect to statutory interpretation, complex arguments. Uh, I don't have that luxury in this case, largely because the issue is so obvious and so plain. Um, 2912B1 begins uh, with a uh, 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 one sentence that has the word commenced in it twice, um, making, making it rather painfully obvious uh, where um, the notice of intent fits in temporally uh, in the uh, process of a filing a medical malpractice case. What is obvious from 2912B1 is that um, the um, notice must be filed before you commence the case. And it requires a 182 day waiting period before you can commence a case. Um, the fact is that it has no application to a case that is already commenced, uh, as is, uh, was involved in this case. Um, if you need further um, statutory uh, textual support for that the basic proposition, uh, you can turn to 2912B3, which is the one exception to that, the one place where the notice of intent statute does in fact apply to amendments uh, in cases that are already filed, and it provides a 91-day notice period if you are adding a new defendant to an existing case. That that is the only situation in which uh, 2912B applies to an existing cause of action. What is involved, obviously, in this case is an existing cause of action that the plaintiff tried to amend. Um, the um, Court of Appeals has had two opportunities to get this issue correct. Um, it failed the first time. Um, uh, it did not apply 2912B1 as it's written. Um, it was barred by law of the case from uh, re-examining this issue. But the, the, the fact is that in addition to the textual easy textual support for, for the position we've taken in this case throughout um, is the fact that I, I've found at least four cases from this court which have described uh, 2912B's uh, operation as a notice that requires that is required before you can commence a case. I've also found a number of decisions from this court and the Court of Appeals which describe the notice uh, under 2912B as a pre-suit notice. Um, the fact is uh, that everything points to a very easy resolution of what the Court of Appeals has made and the Circuit Court has made a very, very difficult problem here uh, through their interpretation or failure to interpret this. 
Um, so the, this, this is a uh, relatively simple case to, um, to resolve, I believe, by this court. But the, I understand that the Court of Appeals has created a very serious problem uh, in this case in the way they have approached this. Um, this case started with a circuit court opinion from many, many years ago, a circuit court opinion that reached an absurd result. And the absurd result that the circuit court reached quite a while ago was that a, a, an amendment of a medical malpractice complaint could not be made to allege a new theory of, uh, of uh, liability, could not be made unless that new theory was in your original NOI. That was the ruling that the circuit court had made originally in this case. The Court of Appeals the first time around uh, uh, did not adopt or did not apply 2912B1 as it was written. And instead, they adopted a, a, another way of perhaps satisfying the, um, the notice of intent requirement. That is, in fact, the second issue that this court has identified in the order uh, granting oral argument in this case. And that is, if the uh, 2912B does, in fact, apply to amendments uh, against an existing defendant, how do you achieve compliance with the notice of intent? That is not an issue that I think this court needs to reach. Um, it is not an issue uh, precisely because 2912B does not apply uh, in, in this circumstance. But this court need not reach uh, the issue that the Court of Appeals decided in its first decision back in October of 2017. And the reason you don't need to reach that is because of what the defendant has uh, offered this court as the alternative mechanism, assuming 2912B does apply. What the defendant said the first time this case was in front of this court was you simply achieve compliance by filing a new NOI with the new claims uh, attached to it. Uh, and then you have to wait uh, the mandatory period and then you can amend your complaint. That was the defendant's idea, okay? And I had not thought of it till the defendants raised it, but that's, that is a way of achieving compliance. Um, and if this court were to find, despite what 2912B1 says about prior to commencing a case, if this court finds that 2912B does in fact require the amendment, uh, excuse me, does it require a new NOI uh, to comply with 2912B, then what the court should do is exactly what the defendant said you can do to achieve compliance, and that is simply do a new NOI. That was the defendant's idea. Now, if the, uh, the fact is that what the defendants are proposing is any time a complaint is filed in a malpractice case and the plaintiff chooses to uh, amend the complaint, the plaintiff must file a motion to amend, must do a new NOI, and then everybody sits around for six months. That's what the defendants are proposing. Okay? But it is a way of achieving compliance because the defendant is saying, just serve a new NOI, put your amended uh, claims into it, and then uh, wait six months to file your motion to amend and uh, we'll proceed from there. Now, not necessary in light of the fact that 2912B1 is so clear that this does not apply to a case that's already commenced. Um, the, the alternative that was adopted by the Court of Appeals in its first decision in this case back on October 2017 was a much more complicated, um, uh, much more involved determination based on this court's decision in Bush versus Shabahang and the application of 2301. Um, I, I, it is an argument I made to the Court of Appeals, but it is not an argument that you should be reaching in this case. And um, I'll rest on my brief with respect to whether the Court of Appeals in the second of its opinions did in fact apply uh, 2301 and uh, the interpretation given that statute in the Bush case. But uh, the reason the Court of Appeals decision in, in this second case, even though unpublished, um, is of significance is because we have basically as a result of this decision, we have gone almost full circle in this case. We began with a circuit court decision 
that reached an absurd result, which was that you cannot amend a medical malpractice case after you've conducted discovery unless the amended theories were in your original NOI. The Court of Appeals in this case, with some assistance from the circuit court, um, has basically uh, almost reached exactly the same result applying 2301 and Bush versus Shabahay. Because what the Court of Appeals did in this case is to basically say, you can't satisfy 2301 and Bush versus Shabahay unless, unless your, um, uh, uh, the theories you're trying to add by amendment were in your original NOI. So I think this, the circle should be broken by this court. This court should be applying uh, 2912B1 exactly the way it's written. You don't have to, you don't have to comply unless the legislature can change it. In order to, certainly put in order to in. break that circle. That, I'm sorry? In order to break that circle that, that you're talking about, the, the, in order to break that circle, um, do you agree with defendants that we have to overrule um, the first version of this case, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, mess up the name again. But also, um, <laughs> Goley, Reeves, Decker, and Bush. No, you, you, you don't have to reach Bush. Okay. Decker is inapplicable here. Well, Decker, Decker, interestingly, Decker, the Court of Appeals decision in Decker got this issue correct. Okay, because there is there is a notation in Becker, and it's cited in my brief. Uh, it's the one case that actually, actually got this right. And the, and the uh, amazing um, irony of this case is Decker was cited in the first Kostadinovsky opinion by the Court of Appeals as the reason why it could not apply 2912B1 as it's written. But Decker is the one case that said explicitly that you don't have to send out a new NOI when you amend the complaint. Um, it's cited in a footnote to my brief. Oh, uh, here's what Decker said, uh, the 2010 opinion by the Court of Appeals. The plaintiff was only required under 2912B1 to provide the statutory notice before she commenced her lawsuit. And it goes on to say, plaintiff was not required to file a second notice of intent with regard to those defendants after they, she was granted leave to file her amended complaint. That's what the Court of Appeals said in Decker. And amazingly, Decker became the basis for the Michigan Court of Appeals decision the first time we were through that court for the proposition that you can interpret 2912B1 to, uh, 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 you, I mean, you must interpret 2912B1 to apply to the amendment that is at issue in this case. In other words, they used the case that explicitly said you don't have to file uh, a, a, a new NOI. It's, it's, by the way, footnote six of my brief. Um, a, a really strange, strange result in the Court of Appeals. Um, but you, Bush, Bush is a little too complicated for this, and as the Court of Appeals was able to get this wrong, Bush, if it's applied incorrectly, as it was in this case, um, it reaches the same result that, that somehow you are required to have incorporated these new theories in your original NOI. Um, and that's the, that's the real sticking point from the Court of Appeals decision in this case. But it's not an issue you need to reach, and you don't need to reach it for two different reasons. The first being 2912B does not apply to the amendments that are at issue here. And if it does apply, then you simply require a new NOI with the new theories in it, and everybody sits around for six months. And or, 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 or you just that. amend it per bush. Pardon? Or, or you just amend the NOI per bush, don't you? Isn't that the other remedy? Yes. I mean, and as you essentially got a, I'm having a, I, I held back, but you're essentially here. You you got a, I think, a favorable decision out of the Court of Appeals, but you appeal. All you have to do is is follow Bush and file an amended NOI. Yes, and and we did. And and so what? no, wait wait, you don't have to file an amended NOI under Bush. Under Bush, you you simply you, you, under Bush the the well. I guess you would have to file a new NOI. But the fact is, the Bush 
and 2301 and allowing the amendment have two requirements, okay? And that's unfortunately what the Court of Appeals got wrong the second time through. But the fact is you don't have to rely on Bush and 2301. I understand. You take us back to the text of the statute. I understand. Thank you. Mr. Cook. May it please the court, <clears throat> Michael Cook on behalf of the defendants at Belize, Dr. Stephen Harrington and advanced <coughs> cardiothoracic surgeons. I want to focus my free fire time on jurisprudential significance and clear air because I think those are the two bases for this court to take action in a case like this. Jurisprudential significance, the most uh, stark admission that I've seen in a case is in the reply brief in the footnote where they say that the council has never encountered circumstance like this before. Mr. Granzato has a very busy docket. A lot of it involves medical malpractice cases. His co-counsel is no exception to that. They've never seen this before. Neither have I. This case involves an entirely new claim, entirely new theory of breach, entirely new theory of causation being brought up anew into the case at the end of it. They've never seen it before. So this is one case that you're talking about. We've argued it before and you took it past the first time. I think you should do it the second time. The reason, another factor con to consider is what happens if you change the rule. Right now, the rule is pretty simple. All claims are treated the same. All medical malpractice claims need a notice, right, before you put it into an action, before you commence an action on it. If you change the rule, there are going to be some unintended consequences from that, right? So the example is Gully Reeves. Gully Reeves, you could give notice of a claim against a surgeon, against a hospital. <clears throat> involving a surgeon, file the action, and then toss in claims involving nurses, anesthesiologists, the emergency room doctor, send the defendant scrambling. They never got the notice that the legislature intended them to get for those claims. That's what happens if you adopt Mr. Granzato's argument. Another example, plaintiff sends a notice for a claim against a doctor, use this case as an example, sends a notice involving uh, a clot theory to the doctor, during the pre-trial or pre-suit discovery or you know, workup of the case, before they file the action, they dis discover this new claim involving low blood pressure. They are incentivized to not give notice of that claim before filing the action. They're incentivized to wait, file the action, then put that new claim in, surprising the defendant in a resulting gamesmanship. So in an area where the legislature recognized the complexity, the need for notice, and an opportunity to discuss, resolve these claims. Counsel, good morning. Yes, good morning. So, so I, I, I can't tell, is the free fire up? Yes. Not, yep. oh, okay. <laughs> um, if we could just do the oral with the bell. Yeah, please. Um, uh, but but I, I, just, I just wanted to kind of jump in here in talking about gamesmanship. And I totally hear and totally um, respect kind of what it is that what, what, what your argument is, but couldn't you argue it the other way that ultimately, you know, you know me, I like to keep things kind of really simple, which is at the end of the day, isn't this, isn't this really, it's a new theory, it's not a new person, right? Isn't that really the emphasis of the NOI? I mean, basically now we're, we're talking about, we're not talking about, an, we're not talking about a new person, we're just talking about a new theory. And I guess I would push back a little bit, which is, I just don't see how this would benefit a plaintiff to basically go through all this work, all this investigation, then change it, you know, mid-course. It just seems to be, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem like it, it would make sense. But then I could be wrong, so please explain. Sure. So in terms of being the same person, you're, you're obviously right. You're obviously right about that. And isn't, in, that the of of, it, isn't that the whole idea of the NOI, is that it's about the person, not no. about the... It, it, it's giving the defendant the information about the claim that is coming to it to evaluate and assess whether that is a claim that they want to litigate, that they think is defensible, that they would want to go out and hire experts and go through depositions and the whole entire process of that, or is, is this something that they want to resolve? And so in the context of the NOI statute, it gets very detailed. It isn't just the plaintiff sends the defendant, hey, uh, I had this bad outcome, I think you're the cause of it, I'm going to see. You have to lay out the, the exact standard of care, exactly how it was breached, exactly how that breach caused the injury. So it's very specific, and in terms of shifting But isn't that part of the complaint? 
I mean, that's what no. I don't understand. It's like you're, you're still doing it, but you're just doing it in the complaint. So in the medical malpractice context, the notice statute does require, just generally I'm speaking, does require the defendant to get this advance notice before it receives the complaint. Everyone agrees about that, right? Right. We're talking about bringing up an entirely new theory, and not just amending, which is what Decker and some of the pre prior cases, about, right. a slightly different iteration of the same concept. We're talking about bringing up an entirely separate theory against the defendant. And my point is the statute speaks in specifics. And it requires the defendants to get these notices before they're required to litigate them. And so when you're talking about the specifics, otherwise you're just throwing that requirement out the door, right? If, you're, if one, notice of one claim is notice of all claims, is basically their position, then you are subjecting the defendant to a position where they're not getting full and fair notice of exactly what they're going to be called on to defend. But isn't that standard they are, that one will rise to another? I'm sorry, say that again. Isn't that kind of a standard thing that like, one will rise to another, right? One complaint will rise to another. Like, as you get into this, you find, okay, the, here's the result, but these are the things that got us to the result. Sure, and so on that, I would point out the difference between slight changes or iterations in the <coughs> theory. The basic breach and causation theories are the same. Decker really harps on the causation theory being different. That's true here. And the case here, which is the one that plaintiff's counsel has admitted they've never seen before, where entirely new theory is brought up and, want to be, and wants to be put into a suit, starting all over again from the beginning. And, and to your point, I also want to hit on a, an important point, I think. The medical malpractice overlay of this case makes it kind of analytically interesting, I think. But if you take a step back and look at this as though it were any other personal injury case, you have a case where the plaintiff had the information they needed to file this new theory at the beginning of the case, litigated it for two years, Discovery closed, the defendant moved for summary disposition, and then they moved for leave to amend. In a basic standard tort case, if the trial court denies leave to amend in that situation, that's not an abuse of discretion. I cited cases on that at the end of my brief. So the result in this case is not remarkable. The result in this case also isn't remarkable under the statute that they rely on, 2301. I went back through the history of that statute. That statute has never allowed somebody to interject a new cause of action. It's allowed p people to amend complaints, it used to apply to complaints, to properly describe the claim, which is what Bush does. But here we're talking about, and everyone agrees, an entirely new claim. Well, isn't that, isn't that solve the concern that you raise? And I think it's, it's valid, right, that you're two years in and, and this. And, and maybe that's a reason for not allowing an amendment of the complaint, but not because there isn't an NOI that, was, that wasn't filed identifying it. Maybe it's futility of the theory, maybe it's undue delay, maybe it's harm to the, you know, to the defendant, prejudice to the defendant. The, the standard analysis of a motion to amend, and that may be valid and that may in fact apply in this case, which is maybe why you would win, you know, to successfully defeat a motion to amend. But it's not because they didn't file an NOI that the purpose of which is to give notice to the defendant and the opportunity to, to you know, resolve the case without litigation when you're already in litigation. I mean, the, so maybe, maybe you're correct in doing it. It's not because you haven't filed, because they haven't filed an amended NOI. So my, my point in raising that is solely, again, back to jurisprudential significance of why this court should care about this one case. And again, I'm coming back to something that no one has ever seen before. It's exceedingly rare, and the actual outcome of this case is unremarkable in the, grand, in the context of all the other factors. So in terms of you investing your time and trying to deal with this issue, I don't think it's worth the court's time, frankly. Uh, I think leave should be denied for that reason. I also think leave should be denied because of the reasons that I pointed out. The NOI statute should, and this is a simple rule, it treats all claims the same. It speaks in terms of very specific descriptions of the claims before you put in to commence an action on it. And that's what's happening here. And I also want to hit on the point that the legislature contemplated additional notices to the same defendant. They contemplated the scenario. It's in subsection six. They addressed sending additional notices to the same defendant. So 
to say that it, it clearly doesn't apply after an action has been convinced, I don't think answers the question. I don't think it expresses the legislature's actual intent, which is shown in the detail that it requires of these notices and the fact that it ex expected people to send new notices. If they didn't expect people to send new notices, then why was that provision in there? Uh, so, the, let's see. What, what, what do you get out of filing a whole new N NOI and, and pausing the case for six months again? Right, so that's, that's the next note I was gonna come to. <laughs> so the, the concept that you serve this NOI and everyone sits around for six months is, in my view, impermissibly dismissive of that legislative period. The, the legislature decide, decided you should give defendants this period of time. In terms of pausing the case, that wouldn't have happened in this case. So in the record, they say the plaintiff's counsel knew about this in July, before, about eight months before they moved to amend. If he had sent the notice then, you have six months, you can keep litigating the case that you've already pled. And then come time, you can put in the new theory, everyone's aware of it, and so you can proceed and litigate the case from there. Also, the idea that you are forced to sit, sit there and wait for six months for the action to resume is falsity because the defendants can waive the period. So if the defendant doesn't want the benefit of this period the legislature has given it, if they decide initially, no, we're in litigation, we think this new claim is meritless as well, we're gonna litigate it, they can waive and the case will continue on at that point. But if they don't, then they're just getting the legislatively provided notice and an opportunity to address the claim before they have to start taking depositions on it, before they have to start doing discovery on it. And, and, and why do things. that when Bush allows for a retroactive amendment to the NOI? So it, if Bush allowed, if we're talking Bush, then we're talking about the no statute applies. So they had to give the notice, right? And so if Bush doesn't apply, right? You can't satisfy Bush's two tests, the substantial, or substantial rights of the defendants and uh, furtherance of justice. You can't satisfy the first one because you're denying the defendant the opportunity to have that notice period. Again, this is a unique case where the, it's an entirely new theory. In Bush, the notice at least referred to the concept of the claim that they wanted to put in. In this case, it's entirely new theory. They, didn't, they didn't get any notice of it and any opportunity to, to evaluate it without the context of litigation. And the second is furtherance of justice. The trial court did, did Bush rely on that reasoning? Yes. That this is really not a new claim. It's just yeah. a spin-off of it. Therefore, we're going to permit. It. I mean, I admit Absolutely. it's a strikingly they, illogical rule to me, but it is what it is. It, and that case is out there. It is what it is. Um, and I'm not here today to ask you to overrule it. So it, they did. They they went through the NOI. They described the claims that were in it, and they they the theories that weren't properly described in it were direct liability claims against the hospital for negligent hiring and training of nurses, and I think some other staff members. And that was referenced in there. It said, it said the hospital's you know, liable for hiring and training, but it didn't say exactly what hiring errors or protocols they should have had and, and how they violated. So that was expressly the part of Bush that said, you meet the substantial rights part of it because this notice, the defendant could understand that you were going to sue them for this negligent hiring and training concept. You just didn't flush it out. Uh, the way I've described it before is Bush, uh, they just didn't put you know, meat on the bones. Here, the case is unique and different because there are no bones. There's no inkling of this theory uh, in any sort of notice. And so that's why I, I don't think you can then amend your complaints if you haven't complied with the notice statute. And I do think the notice statute requires to treat all claims the same before you commence an action on it. Um, I guess it, unless there are other questions, I'm happy to address them. Otherwise, I'll ask you to deny leave or affirm. Thank you. Thank you. You have 31 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> See how much magic you can do in 31 seconds. <laughs> but I'm going to actually ask you a question. Oh, well, oh. Yeah, there you go. We, we, haven't, we haven't started Tennessee. the clock yet. Oh. Apparently oh. you have forever. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, I, I actually would like to, if you could respond to the jurisprudential um, mention. I mean, ultimately, if it's your contention that this is like 
the first time you've ever seen this. Oh, Why is this jurisprudentially significant? Why should we get involved and, yes. and explain the distinction between the tangential versus new theory? Okay, if Mr. if Mr. Cook's position is that this is so novel and has never happened, then why do I get one or two or three calls every year from people who are concerned with exactly, exactly this thing? They call me, they want to know, what do I do? I have these new theories to put into a case. What do I have to do with, the, with respect to the NOI? I get these calls because this happens a lot, okay? And the fact is, they have to, they have to know, what are we gonna do with the NOI? So the suggestion that this doesn't happen is completely incorrect. And the problem that exists for you is the two opinions that have been written by the Court of Appeals in this case are, first of all, incorrect with respect to the actual uh, effect of 2912B, its literal text, and they make no mention, no mention at all, of the simple solution that Mr. Cook has himself advocated. So nobody knows from reading these two decisions that all you have to do, if in fact 2912B does apply to an amendment against an existing defendant, you just have to file a new NOI. Put the new theories in. That's Mr. Cook's idea, and he was right. And there's no statute of limitations problem because of relation back. But you can't find that in these two opinions. And that's why people are going to be misled by these two opinions. And I want to say one other thing. The, the practicality of medical malpractice is you do not have people come to you as a plaintiff's attorney and go off and file a complaint. It is not, that's just not the way it works. The way it works is you have people come to you with a medical malpractice uh, uh, situation. You, you, you bring the doctors in, you bring the experts in immediately, and you plead the, the claims that your expert says that you have. You don't hold back claims, you plead the claims that the expert says you have. That's what goes into your original complaint. And if you have to amend because of discovery, things that get discovered, and that is precisely what happened here, you have to be able to amend to allow for things that you, your expert didn't tell you about at the beginning. I'm sorry if I took too much time. No, thank you. Uh, the case will be submitted, and we will uh, break for lunch and be back at 12.30. It is.